Freeman Dyson about 60 years ago imagined that an advanced civilization will construct a mega a big structure around its star to harvest the energy output from the star. Uh, we are when we are talking about clean energy, it's the energy imp- impacting the Earth. That's a very small fraction of the total area uh, surrounding the sun, and uh, it's about one part in a hundred million. So imagine a civilization that wants to harvest a hundred million times more energy than we can get on Earth from the sun. Uh, the way to do it is to surround the star with a mega structure. And uh, if you look at the engineering aspects of it, the best way to do that is to have tiles. Uh, each of which is floating above the over the star uh, by the radiation coming from the, the 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 sun or the star pushing it out at exactly the same force as gravity is pulling it in. So it's basically hovering just like a kite drifting in the wind. You know that it can drift uh, above the star, and you, you put a lot of these tiles, you build uh, what is called the Dyson sphere, so that you harvest. The energy, and then imagine this: the star evolving, just like we talked about before, getting brighter. Then the, these tiles will break apart, okay? Because the radiation pressure now will exceed gravity, and so they would become interstellar objects. You know, very easy to lift them out of the gravitational potential well because they are already very marginally bound. So maybe Oumuamua was a piece of that, uh, you know, a tile of that of that kind of mega structure. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 111. And this episode is with Avi Loeb, who is Frank B. Baird Jr., Professor of Science in the Department of Astronomy at Harvard University, where he was also the chair. And before joining Harvard, he spent 15 years working in theoretical astrophysics at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's also among plenty of other positions. Uh, titles, awards he's won. He is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation, the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard, and head of the Galileo Project. And I think that Avi's background, his qualifications are extremely important because they show just how seriously you should take his controversial, and I say controversial based on the opinions and reactions to others of others in his field to the theory he has that we have observed at least one object of extraterrestrial origin. Well, we've we've observed plenty of things of extraterrestrial origin, but uh, the origin is extraterrestrial life. So we begin by discussing Avi's background, how he was really a I don't mean this in a negative sense, a conventional astrophysicist working in black holes, other areas of cosmology. But after a comet, Oumuamua, passed through the solar system in 2017 with this whole constellation, pun intended, of bizarre or improbable features, Avi came to the conclusion that it was an object of... or a fragment perhaps of an extraterrestrial spacecraft or some other structure. So we talk all about this, why Avi believes it, why other astrophysicists do not. And then we get into Avi's upcoming book, Interstellar, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars. And that's going to be released on August 29th, 2023. So There is a link, obviously, to Interstellar in the description, but you should also check out Avi on Medium. He releases plenty of very, plenty of very thought compelling essays and pieces and quite, quite regularly, and they're quite accessible. So you should definitely check that out. And then there's a Discord now where you can chat with other geeselings and let me know how you feel about the show. Any guests you want to see, that sort of thing, you can find that through robinsonerhard.com. And then likes, comments, reviews, subscribes, all of these things are extraordinarily helpful. So without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Avi. The majority of your pretty 
incredible career in astrophysics has been devoted to what I'll call, I mean, classic or standard cosmological and astrophysical problems, whether that's, I mean, black hole formation, uh, galaxy formation, stellar genesis. But what this leads me to wonder is whether it was some personal event that made you much more interested in taking extraterrestrial life seriously as the focus of a research program, or if it was just the product of new technological developments that made it more promising, uh, fresh evidence, the status of having reached a certain stage in your career, or a mix of these other sorts of factors. It was a combination of two important things that happened around the same time, five years ago. One was that uh, we have the facilities that allow us, for the first time in history, to detect objects that came from outside the solar system. That's what many people do not realize, that over the past decade, we developed survey telescopes that for the first time can see an object the size of a football field from the reflection of sunlight. Before the last decade, we didn't have that capability for an object that passes within the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Uh, they weren't looking at the entire sky. They weren't sensitive enough. Astronomers focused on a small region of the sky. And also the U.S. government established a new set of satellites, ground-based sensors that can look at meteors. These are new capabilities that did not exist more than a decade ago, and they resulted in something new. Uh, so um, a survey telescope named PANSTARS was established in Hawaii uh, as a result of a decision by the U.S. Congress to task NASA to find 90% of all the objects bigger than a football field because if such an object collides with the Earth, it will cause a lot of damage and um, you know a lot of deaths. And so the, the scale was set to 140 meters. I mean, we know pretty much of much bigger objects. You know, we know all of them. But uh, the question is, you know, what are what about those 140 meter objects that the size of a football field that can cause really devastation uh, in, if they happen to hit New York City? Uh, and so um, we want to know 90% of them that come close to Earth. And so this telescope was established to survey the sky about a decade ago in Hawaii. And in 2017, it saw an object of that size coming close to Earth. So it flagged it, okay? Just like it flags any object that comes close to Earth. It's a near-Earth object. And then the telescope measured the speed of this object and the astronomers realized, oh, wait a minute, this object is not like the others we have seen for many years, which were bound to the sun, gravitationally bound to the sun. This one is moving too fast. So you know that if you were to throw a tennis ball up, it comes back down. But if you were to throw it hard enough at a high enough speed, it will escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. Same is true for the sun. If an object moves fast, too fast, it's not bound to the sun. So it's unlike the planets that are moving around the sun since the solar system was born. This object, for the first time, it's the first object that we saw moving fast enough to be unbound to the sun came from the interstellar space outside the solar system. So that was a revelation. And of course, um, you know, it was particularly intriguing for me because a decade earlier, I forecasted, I wrote the first paper uh, that forecasted how many rocks we should see from other planetary systems, assuming that they are similar to the solar system, with the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii, and we predicted zero. And we predicted by that it will not be able to see rocks from other systems by orders of magnitude. So uh, then when the report came out, it was intriguing to me because it means the calculation was wrong that maybe the amount of objects ejected from other Planetary systems is much more than we expect based on what we see in the solar system. And you have to understand, that's the beauty of science. When you make a prediction and it turns out to be wrong by experiment, you learn something new. Okay, so it, it makes you happy because you learn something new. Just to give you another example, Albert Einstein wrote three papers between 1935 and 1940 claiming 
that black holes do not exist in one of them, claiming that gravitational waves do not exist in another one of them, claiming that quantum mechanics may not have spooky action at a distance because it makes no sense in the third of them, okay? So he made three statements about the frontiers of science, all of which ended up being wrong, all three of them. And the Nobel Prize over the past six years was awarded to experimental teams that showed Einstein wrong. Three Nobel Prizes were awarded for the, the demonstration black holes exist, another one for the demonstration gravitational waves exist, and a third one for quantum entanglement, which is basically what Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. So the point is, science is a learning experience, despite what some you know, uh, educators try to say that, you know, uh, what you see in the textbooks is what science is about. No, that's not. Science is about making mistakes. It's about going after unexpected results, anomalies, because they teach us something new. So it's not about confirming our past knowledge. It's about uncovering new knowledge. And the way we learn new knowledge is because, you know, we are uh, observing nature and nature you know, it's more imaginative than we are. So it's really thrilling for a scientist like myself to realize, wait a minute, uh, nature is telling us something new about what lies outside the solar system. There was a precedence of that. Uh, We tended to think that the material we find in the solar system, that our bodies are made of, the sun is made of, the earth is made of, this material that we see is what the universe is made of. That's very natural to say, okay, what we see near us in our backyard is also what the universe is made of. Turns out to be wrong. Back in 1933, Fritz Zwicky from Caltech observed that galaxies move very fast in groups of galaxies so that the amount of material that you see there is not sufficient to bind these galaxies and they should fly apart, yet they are bound together. So we still, 90 years later, we don't know what this substance that makes up most of the universe, like six times more than ordinary matter, we call it dark matter. We don't know what it is. That's the first time the universe told us, don't assume that what you find in your backyard is what exists out there. The second time is when Panstas discovered this first interstellar object uh, that was reported, uh, which was named Oumuamua. And so for me, it was a revelation that it was found, but also later on, it showed many anomalies and we can talk about them. It didn't look like the rocks we found in the source. So that was the first thing, the first shot that was heard around the world, so to speak. I live uh, uh, in uh, the Lexington Concord area near Boston, and there was a real shot heard around the world here when uh, the the revolution, the, the... rebellion against the British uh, started. Um, But scientifically speaking, for me, this was the first shot heard around the world that perhaps objects that enter the solar system might be different than what we find in the solar system, which are rocks, basically. Uh, Either icy rocks or bare rocks, uh, the building blocks of the planet. Anyway, uh, the second thing that happened uh, was more personal, that uh, around the same time, uh, both my parents passed away. And, uh, you know, I learned from experience. um, And um, basically what he taught me is that um, we live for a short time. So we better focus on substance and not on how many likes we get on social media or how many people really, uh, you know, uh, support the point of view that we uh, hold. Uh, because on occasion, you know, we might realize something that nobody else realizes, or we might um, be unpopular for a while, and then this notion becomes popular. And I've seen it over and over again in in my career, where you know, a- extrasolar planets, you know, were ridiculed, not really taken seriously uh, when I entered astrophysics, and after. You know, they were discovered, it became obvious that they exist, and everyone says, of course. The same about dark matter, it was really ignored for 40 years. And then only after that, it started to become 
the folklore of the mainstream. And many times in the mainstream, you see ideas that ended, end up being wrong. The latest example is supersymmetry, you know, it's a new symmetry of nature. And the physicists decided to invest $10 billion uh, to test that, uh, to find evidence for that symmetry in the, in the form of new particles. They are called supersymmetric particles. And the Large Hadron Collider at CERN was established at the cost of $10 billion. And we didn't find it in the natural range of parameters. Now, would the mainstream suggest, oh, you know, we shouldn't have done it? No, because as I said before, many times at the frontiers of science, we are wrong about our expectations. And by the way, I had, just as an anecdote, I had lunch uh, a few months ago with a particle physicist, and I asked him, you are now towards the end of your scientific career. What do you regard as your most important contribution? Okay, And he said, it's a paper that I wrote about supersymmetry. And I said, well, but it looks like it was not found. So why do you you know, think about it as your most successful accomplishment? And he said, well, you know, maybe it's around the corner. And I was reminded by uh, the Lubavitch community in Brooklyn because they had a rabbi, the Lubavitcher rabbi. It's an Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, and I visited them once, and they believe that the rabbi is the Messiah. And they believe it so much that they built an apartment in Israel that is an identical replica of the apartment that this rabbi had in Brooklyn. It looked exactly like it because the belief is that when the Messiah comes, uh, the Messiah will go to Israel, uh, to the Jerusalem, and they wanted him to find the toilets. So they built an apartment so that he would feel at home. Okay, they believed it to that level. The, the replica exists in Israel still. And um, then he died. Okay, so that's an, an empirical fact, okay? But now in the context of spirituality, just like not finding supersymmetry is an empirical fact in the context of the Large Hadron Collider. And now, what did they do in response to this fact? They said, oh, we just need to wait. Now I ask you, how different is that response in the context of spirituality to the response of the particle physicist whom I spoken with about supersymmetry? It's just around the corner. So what I'm trying to say is that when you deal with the unexpected or when you explore uh, the unknown, it's all about the way human res respond to that. It has nothing to do whether you're dealing with science or you're dealing with religion. It's the same response. Now, what do we have as the, uh, you know, as the rescue uh, device that helps us being more realistic? It's actually the evidence that nature shows us. So on many occasions, people will either dismiss the evidence, brush it under the carpet, just so that it will not violate their prejudice. And if you were to subscribe to that folklore, if you were to seek uh, approval from people around you to get likes, you may not um, subscribe to the right notion. And the uh, best example is, is Galileo Galilei, four centuries ago. Hmm. Well, okay, I have a, a number of, of thoughts and comments. One, you mentioned Fritz Zwicky, and I seem to recall this is just totally anecdoted, anecdotal and really unrelated to uh, the question of extraterrestrial life. But from my time uh, studying astrophysics, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, but that he once said somebody was a spherical bastard. That's because true. <laughs> no matter what way you looked at them, they were, they were still a bastard. <laughs> right. No, that's true. He was not a very social person. Uh, but science, what I'm trying to say, is not a popularity contest. What we are trying to do here is very serious. We are trying to understand reality. Now, you, so you may ask, why is that important? 
Why don't we take recreational drugs and enjoy ourselves? Why don't we put goggles of the metaverse on our head and enjoy ourselves? We can live in the metaverse next to celebrities, own a house that is worth tens of millions of dollars in the metaverse, and feel good about ourselves. Why not do that? Well, my point is because we are all constrained by the actual reality that we all share. It has nothing to do with taking drugs or being in the metaverse. There is a physical reality surrounding us that we all share. And why do we need to adapt to it? Because it determines our fate. So suppose you were to subscribe to the notion of the clergy during the days of Galileo and say, I don't want to look through the telescopes, as the clergy said. I just want to believe that we are at the center of the world. You would feel good about yourself because you play a central role in the big scheme of things. The problem with that is that you are not adapting to reality. If the earth moves around the sun and you think that the sun moves around the earth, then when you send a spacecraft to space, you will never reach your destination because your model is wrong. So there is a reality out there. And understanding it allows us to adapt to it in a way that uh, basically allows us to achieve our goals reliably. If you were to suggest that, you know, that uh, the COVID-19 is not a virus, it's something else that humans are talking about that has, you know, whatever kind of imagination you might have, and you are not adapting to the reality where it is a virus and you're not developing a vaccine based on your understanding of how the human body uh, operates, then you will not be able to cope with it. I mean, people had illusions about reality for millennia. And the whole point of, of science is, let's figure out what the actual reality is all about so that we can adapt to it. And that serves a very important role. It's this our ability to survive. You know, it's just the Darwinian principle of the let the fittest survive. So The fittest in the context of an intelligent species is a species that is uh, not subscribing to narratives that are, you know, illusionary, that are uh, satisfying the ego of the the, the members of that species, but basically learning uh, the environment that they live in so that they can survive for longer times. And so, for, for example, if we have global warming, we need to understand it, okay? It's not a matter of a political narrative that one side can believe one thing, the other another. Let's collect facts. Let's figure out how to cope with it, okay? Uh, because if we don't, we will burn up. Um, if we realize that within a billion years, the sun will burn up the earth. By the way, I once went uh, to get um, a prescription to my glasses, and uh, I, you know, I, I approached the receptionist, and I said, you know, I m- maybe my number changed and, you know, everything changes in life. Even the sun will die one day, you know, within seven billion years. And the receptionist said, what? That's news for me. I didn't know that the sun will die. It's against my religion. So I said to her, well, you know, I'm sorry to break the news. I'm an astronomer. That's my profession. I can guarantee to you that the sun will die because... It's basically a nuclear re- uh, a nuclear fusion reactor, and it will eventually consume its fuel and die. That was a shock for her that the sun will die because we see it every day, and it was part of her belief systems that the sun will be forever uh, around forever. So you can believe in that. That's fine. But in a billion years, the sun will evolve and burn up the surface of Earth. And if you are not prepared for that and you're, you will stay on Earth, then uh, humanity will perish. So for, I mean, obviously we can believe in a religion that says the sun will stay the same forever, but eventually any such species, you know, will be shorter lived than a scientific species that says, okay, I understand how stars burn up their fuel and I decide to go into space. Uh, in fact, I, I want to build a platform that will adjust the distance from the, cha- the the sun based on how hot it gets. You know, that that is the intelligent thing to do. And so altogether, understanding reality offers the benefit of adapting to it. That's my point. And as a species, science offer, offers us this opportunity to learn from nature. And 
unfortunately, many humans prefer not to get the message. They prefer to either subscribe to a belief system that flatters their ego or to popular opinion that has nothing to do with evidence. I just want to clarify before we move on. There were these two events that got you interested in studying the in studying extraterrestrial life. And one was the development of technology like PanStar that enabled the observation of Oumuamua. And then the other, which you might need to clarify a bit for me, is that, as I heard you, the death of your parents made you reassess the focus of your work. And you felt that focusing on extraterrestrial life, which is a question that we can say is um, very deeply uh, uh, earthed or unearthed in the unknown was more important than some of the perhaps less less impactful questions like black hole formation. And before you bef before you clarify, the reason that I want to stress this is just to make clear both for myself and for our listeners that it's not like you've always had this agenda and been trying to find aliens everywhere you looked. This is a this is a scientifically motivated project. Exactly. Uh, with respect to uh, you know my parents' death, there are two aspects to it. One is indeed, you know, I have several decades left for my life, and I want to make the most out of them, and I want to be efficient, so I don't want to be distracted. And there is this evidence about objects coming into the solar system for the first time, and they look weird. They look anomalous. And I want to study them. I don't want to say, well, it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. I want to allow for the possibility that they might be artificial in origin. Okay. The second aspect of it is um, taking risks. You know, I, I chaired the astronomy department at Harvard for nine years, three terms, three consecutive terms, because the usual term is three years, and I've I've served three. And um, I was I also chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies for three years, uh, and I was the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation, I still am. Uh, I was the founding director of the uh, Black Hole Initiative at Harvard, and I was the chair of the board, uh, the scientific advisory board of the Starshot project. So all of these are different, con I, I was also on the President's Council on, of, on Science and Technology Policy at the White House. So. What I'm trying to say is I'm part of the establishment. And what changed at that point in time around five years ago is that I allowed myself uh, to take a risk in advocating for a study that was not within the mainstream. And the reason is because I believe that it should be in the mainstream. I believe that this question is of great interest to the public. The same taxpayers that often scientists say, we don't want to take risks in order not to waste taxpayers' money. Well, guess what? You should ask the taxpayers what they care about. They would care about this question much more than uh, the nature of dark matter on which we are spending billions of dollars. And we are spending you know, less than a percent of a percent of that amount on the study of extraterrestrial technological signatures. So my point is, we better tune to the public's interest. And now it's also the government's interest there, there is a new office in government that was just established um, uh, under the Department of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. And, and their interest is national security because there are reports about objects they don't understand that are unidentified and they want to figure it out. So at any event, the word extraterrestrial is mentioned in that context as well. It was mentioned by the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, that sat next to me at the Washington National Cathedral in November 2021. And, you know, she said that uh, Avril Haynes uh, admitted that, you know, we should allow for that possibility uh, because she doesn't know what some of these objects are. I asked her and she said, I don't know. Um, and I also, it, there was uh, Jeff Bezos in, in the same panel and he said that he was inspired to create Blue Origins uh, as a result of watching Star Trek. And I told Avril, you know, I was never a fan of science fiction because I enjoy doing science and uh, I love reading fiction, but the combination of the two very often violated the laws of physics and I didn't enjoy that. And Avril said uh, to me, Avi, we should work on you. Uh, so I, I, I'm not open-minded so much to creating 
no physics in order to explain things we see with poor data. I think we need exquisite data to, to at any event. So the point is, I was willing to take risks that I would not otherwise allow myself when my parents were around because I, I had a very strong connection with my mother, speaking with her on a daily basis. And she would have been very worried about what could happen as a result of that. Okay. But once they passed away, I, I felt responsible for my own path in a way. And, you know, I just said, the hell with it. I will just do what seems to me like common sense because very often common sense is not common. And in this case, you have on the one side, you have believers. These are people within the general public who make claims without any evidence to substantiate those claims that are very similar to religious beliefs. They just believe, you know, in, in the existence of things. Uh, where and, and then you have the uh, scientists that say, we don't want to sleep in the same bed with those believers. That violates the scientific method. So therefore, we ridicule that. And we don't want to discuss it. We don't want to include it, any discussion of it in our conferences. That includes even the SETI community that didn't want to discuss objects that may have arrived near Earth from an extraterrestrial technological civilization. They decided to ban any discussion in their conferences about that. And so I say, both of these are inappropriate because the scientific method is uh, being intrigued by a possibility and then examining it. And we sent five probes to interstellar space in the last 50 years. So, you know, and we now know that a substantial fraction of all the stars like the sun uh, within the Milky Way galaxy have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation, somewhere between 3% to 100%. So it's a substantial fraction. And, and, and so what we see in our backyard is not unique or special. And most of the stars form billions of years before the sun. So I think it's quite arrogant of us to say, you know, we are the only ones. Uh, and moreover, you know, we haven't really studied objects. Just over the past decade, you know, we were able to detect them and they look anomalous. So let's just go out and search, you know. Elon Musk made a statement a few weeks ago. Uh, he said, well, I'm the space guy. You know, I would know if there were aliens. And uh, I say to that, I say, well, you know, Elon Musk, basically the best he knows is uh, in the vicinity of Earth. Okay. And uh, um, relative to the size of the universe, that's just like the size of the head of a pin relative to the most distant planet within the solar system. So imagine an ant uh, studying, surveying the head of a pin and making statements about the planets that make up the solar system. Like, this would be a very presumptuous ant. <laughs> very. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're getting exactly to where I want to go. So before we consider some of your positive arguments in favor, not just of the existence of extraterrestrial life, but that it might be much closer than is commonly held in the mainstream narratives. I'm hoping we can first discuss, and this is where I say you're already getting to where I want to go, the more general Fermi paradox and how other physicists and astrophysicists might explain why it is not, in fact, a paradox. So the idea, as you know, but maybe our listeners don't is roughly that we have significant grounds and you've alluded to some of them for believing that there is other life out there perhaps abundant life but at the same time it does not general it's not generally accepted that we have evidence for that life and so why do your colleagues though think that this is and maybe this is a good time also to mention the drake equation as well yeah so i think the fundamental thing to recognize which many people miss is that time is measured in billions of years in the context of the universe. And the, we as a, as a species, you know, you, Homo sapiens started only a few million years ago. So that's uh, just uh, one part in 10,000 of the age of the universe. That's when uh, your Homo sapiens started. The recorded human history is only 5,000 years old, okay? 
So that's another factor of uh, 100 this uh, shorter, okay? So now we are talking about one part in a million of the age of the universe recorded human history. And moreover, the region that we usually survey is the Earth or the vicinity of Earth, which, as I said before, it's a quadrillion times smaller region than the extent of the universe, okay? So imagine you're looking at a region that is a quadrillion of the system that you're talking about. And what that implies is that human experience is very limited, okay? And if Enrico Fermi sat at lunch with colleagues uh, in Los Alamos in a given year and said, where is everybody? You know, uh, that, again, is very presumptuous to to make a statement about, you know, the status, the state of the uh, universe at large, because because during that year, the chance of the region in space around him being visited by something that would indicate the existence of extraterrestrial life is really small. He didn't develop a telescope like Pulsar to even look at the or- region around uh, the sun where objects might come into uh, from outside the solar system. He he just asked, where is everybody? And and it's just like someone sitting at home in the living room and saying, I don't have any neighbors because I don't see anyone next to me, you know? And obviously you have to look through your windows and you better even step out uh, to your backyard and check if you have any objects that came from the neighbor's yard, you know, like maybe a tennis ball that uh, were, was uh, thrown by a neighbor. Just insisting that you have no neighbors without searching for neighbors is is not the scientific method it's a prejudice okay and uh, my point is that uh fermi's paradox may be just a reflection of the limited time and space that we have surveyed and um, moreover uh, the methods that we used because we were looking for example for 70 years for radio signals okay And this is a very primitive technology for communication that we are actually uh, not using as much as we did decades ago. Now we have fiber optics, transmitting signals and other means. Uh, And it's not at all clear that you would find another civilization exactly the same phase that we are at, at the time that you're listening, because it's just like waiting for a phone call, okay? You can wait for a phone call at home, and if nobody is calling you at the time that you're waiting for it, just one century or so, you know, you will not hear a phone call. But there is a better method, which is to go out and check your mailbox or check your backyard. And that's a completely different method because the sender may not be alive. If you just look at the solar system, you know, the the Earth existed for 4.6 billion years since the solar system was formed. And um, and, um, uh, we have... I mean, life formed very early on on Earth, but it's about to be extinguished within one billion years. We just have 20% left because uh, we know how the sun will evolve and it will burn up, uh, boil off all the oceans on Earth within a billion years. It will get hotter uh, as a result of a greenhouse effect. So irrespective of whether we deal with global warming or not, the sun will basically eliminate the prospects for life as we know it on the surface of Earth. So now you say, okay, that's the sun. But when you look at other sun-like stars, you know, they formed billions of years before the sun. So if there was another planet like us next to them, like ours, uh, and another civilization like us on that planet, you know, by now the star boiled off all liquid water on the surface and they cannot be there anymore. They were, they perished if they stayed on that planet. And of course, there were probably cries for help uh, when, you know, that was the biggest news item in the in all the media. Uh, you know, our star is about to kill us. What do we do? We have to go. There the must might have been an exodus of the wealthy people boarding spacecraft, leaving the planet to elsewhere and so forth. And a lot of people, a, a lot of creatures may have died as a result of not being on those spacecraft. And uh, we didn't hear those cries for help because we were not around most of the billions of years that elapsed. So most of the senders of any equipment, any spacecraft, most of those are dead by now. 
because most stars form billions of years before the sun. If we just make an analogy with the solar system and assume the same replica elsewhere. So my point is that if you are trying to listen to radio signals, you will not hear them because those technological civilizations are not around anymore. It's only those that formed roughly around the same time as we did that have roughly the same technological phase and getting synchronized within one century, which is pretty much the time since we started transmitting radio signals, getting synchronized to that level within billions of years is really a small probability, okay? A small chance, a small window of opportunity for us to listen to someone exactly at the same phase of our technological development. So I would say it's much better to search for objects that they send, for packages in our mailbox that would outlast the senders. And that's what I'm doing. Okay. That was not done for the before the last five years, before we detected interstellar objects. Uh, and of course the idea was mentioned here and there, but it was not pursued. So I'm suggesting that we engage in this search. And the reason is that the first three interstellar objects out of four appeared anomalous. They didn't look like objects that we found before in the solar system. The fourth one did look familiar. It looked like a comet. So um, the fourth one was discovered by an amateur astronomer, Gennady Borisov. It's called Borisov and was discovered in 2019. Look looked just like a comet with small variants. That looks familiar. It's an icy rock, just like the icy rocks we had in the solar system came from interstellar space. But the first three that we can talk about, these were two meteors that I discovered with my student, Amir Siraj, one from 2014, uh, January 2014, the other one from March 2017, both of them roughly a meter in size. So, you know, comparable to the size of a giant watermelon. Um, and the, the third one was Oumuamua that we already mentioned. And all three were anomalous and we can talk about why they looked different mm -hmm. well first uh this is just totally tangential but hearing that earth only has 20 percent of its lifetime left makes it sound so much more pressing and scary than it's ever sounded to me before despite i mean the magnitude of that period relative to human time scales. It just seems like a much bigger existential threat. But yeah, I would really like to talk now about uh, checking our mailbox or searching our mailbox to use your phrase. And in particular, maybe we could start with Oumuamua. And maybe, I mean, in spe specifically, starting with, you mentioned that it was discovered in October 2017, but I'd like to talk about particularly what happened on October 19th, 2017, and then the subsequent 11 days in which we were able to amass evidence. Right. I should just uh, uh, supplement what you said about uh, the window of opportunity we have left, uh, that it's it, it may shrink by a factor of a million if uh, we don't uh, avoid a technological catastrophe, because you know, the biggest risk in my mind right now is, of course, artificial intelligence, you know, in the form of uh, GPT N, where N is bigger than four, you know, and if those systems will be smarter than us and uh, could potentially cause a lot of damage if we allow them to control society, and that could happen on centuries timescale. Uh, and of course, there are other existential risks of, you know, a much more... Um, aggressive pandemic than the one we had uh, leaking from a lab. We don't know if this one leaked from a lab because it's a political issue. Once again, we are not staring at the evidence. We are just politicizing almost every issue. Um, and uh, of course, in this context, it's important to know whether it leaked from a lab because we want to prevent it from happening again. So once again, adapting to reality has a great benefit, but it's often uh, masked by prejudice or a political agenda. And then um, the, the other, of course, uh, possibility is a nuclear war or some other major catastrophe that we inflict on ourselves. So we have to be wary of these things before the sun. We, but the sun will eventually, I mean, that's like in 
inevitable outcome. It's just like being at a certain distance from a furnace and the heat of, of the furnace um, is destined to go up. You know, like uh, there is no way out of that. That's natural evolution of the sun. So we can't avoid that. We just need to increase our distance as the furnace gets uh, hotter. That's So um, at any event, uh, coming back to your question about Oumuamua, uh, on October 19th, uh, 2017, uh, the report came out and they said, well, it's an interstellar object, but actually the first email reporting about it already said, it looks really strange because the amount of light reflected from it was changing every eight hours as it was tumbling. And uh, it was changing by a factor of 10, which is huge. I mean, the, the biggest variation uh, for solar system objects before was about a factor of three, okay? Now, what does it mean? It means that the surface area of the object projected on the sky because uh, changes by of order 10 because that's the, 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 that surface reflects sunlight. So just imagine a, a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. Even if the piece of paper is razor thin, extremely thin, uh, it, it's unlikely to be aligned uh, edge on to your line of sight. Okay, so you a variation in the area of the of the piece of paper as it's tumbling by a factor of ten means that it's re it really has an extreme geometry. Because if you were to take a football uh, object shaped object or a cigar shaped object, you know they would unless you make the cigar ten times longer than it is wide, you know it won't show these variations in cross-sectional area. Okay, so that already made the observers quite um, intrigued. And um, this data was so intriguing to me that I wrote an email to uh, Yuri Milner, an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley that I was in contact with, and I was supposed to visit his home a, a week later, and uh, he funded the breakthrough listen project which is aimed at listening to radio uh, signals uh, perhaps from extraterrestrial civilizations you know that's a search and as I mentioned before it was done for seven years but he, he, he put much more funding behind it so I met him at his home and I said look this object is intriguing I already mentioned that in in my email that it could be of a technological origin so why don't we just check if there's any radio transmission from it? And he agreed, and then uh, we checked, and it was less than than a cell phone. Uh, so it was zero, basically. Uh, um, so we didn't detect any radio signal. But to me, it was intriguing that its shape is so strange. And, and then more and more facts about it um, were realized, recognized. Uh, first, that it came from a very special frame of reference the so-called local standard of rest, which is a sort of like a, the rest frame of, of the galaxy nearby. You know, like the stars are moving relative to each other with random speeds, but when you average those, you end up in the local standard of rest. And the sun is moving relative to that frame at tens of kilometers per second. But this object was nearly at rest, which is very unusual because if it came from a star, you know, only one in 500 stars is are so much at is so much at rest uh, in that frame. So that was another strange thing. Then it was realized that it's actually being pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force uh, that is not gravitational. And usually such a force is coming from the evaporation of comets when uh, through the rocket effect. Outgassing. When material, yeah. outgassing. When material is expelled in one direction, in preferred direction, the object is pushed in the opposite direction, just like a rocket. Uh, but there was no evaporation visible, and actually the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply and couldn't see any traces of carbon-based molecules or dust around it, so it was definitely not a comet. So what is pushing it? And to me, all of these uh, were quite uh, intriguing, and at some point, once this non-gravitational acceleration was um, reported in Nature magazine, I decided, well, maybe... I should write the scientific paper that, suggesting that it's artificial. And I wrote several articles to Scientific American in the months preceding that, suggesting that it may be technological in origin. So then together with a new postdoc, uh, Shmuel Biali, that came to my group, uh, we wrote a paper suggesting maybe it's very thin. It's, a, it's just like a sail, a very thin object pushed by reflecting sunlight and not evaporating at all, just by 
uh, you know, the fact of being thin, it has a large surface area for its mass, so it's getting pushed. And um, we know of such uh, things because we are designing light sails, and basically sails pushed by reflecting light, just the same way that the sail on a boat is pushing the boat on a sailboat uh, by reflecting the molecules of air in, in the wind that is pushing it. Uh, and so in the same way, you can reflect light and get pushed if the object is thin enough. And we calculated it needs to be very thin, but you know, I, I wrote a paper a few months ago suggesting maybe it was a piece of uh, what is called a megastructure, like a Dyson sphere, you know, Freeman Dyson about 60 years ago imagined that an advanced civilization will construct a, mega, a big structure around its star to harvest the energy output from the star. Uh, we are when we are talking about clean energy, it's the energy imp impacting the Earth. That's a very small fraction of the total area uh, surrounding the Sun, and uh, it's about one part in a hundred million. So imagine a civilization that wants to harvest a hundred million times more energy than we can get on Earth from the Sun. Uh, the way to do it is to surround the star with a megastructure. And uh, if you look at the engineering aspects of it, the best way to do that is to have tiles. Uh, each of which is floating above the over the star uh, by the radiation coming from the, the 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 sun or the star pushing it out at exactly the same force as gravity is pulling it in. So it's basically hovering just like a kite drifting in the wind. You know that it can drift uh, above the star, and you, you put a lot of these tiles, you build uh, what is called a Dyson sphere, so that you harvest. The energy, and then imagine this: the star evolving, just like we talked about before, getting brighter. Then the, these tiles will break apart, okay? Because the radiation pressure now will exceed gravity, and so they would become interstellar objects. You know, very easy to lift them out of the gravitational potential well because they are already very marginally bound. So maybe Oumuamua was a piece of that, uh, you know, a tile of that of that kind of mega structure. So at any event, we don't know what it was, but the suggestion was maybe it's very thin. And um, and I should say the paper was accepted for publication within three days. That's a really very fast uh, turnaround, unprecedented. Uh, and um, moreover, the referee said, uh, in fact, there is evidence that the object is flat. So that supports your idea. And indeed, the... Um, about a year later, there was a paper that appeared uh, in the astrophysical journal, uh, well, in, in, in an astrophysical journal, the uh, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And uh, in it, there was a detailed analysis of the variation of light reflected by Oumuamua. And the conclusion was that at the 90% confidence level, uh, this object had the geometry of a flat surface, not cigar shaped, the way it was portrayed in some uh, artist illustrations. It, it, obviously, if you look at a piece of paper that is tilted uh, in your direction, it looks like a cigar projected on the sky, but uh, it was most likely flat. So the referee actually supported us. And then once the paper was, I mean, immediately after that, there was a huge media storm. Uh, I was about to go on a trip to Germany and uh, just a few days later, and um, there was a TV crew at the front door just before I left to the to, to the airport in Boston and and I, I said I'm sorry I have to go and they said well we just have one question are we alone <laughs> and I said I don't know but um, this object looks weird you know um, and I left and there was no Wi-Fi on, on the flight but when I arrived there I had good morning America I had like a, my inbox email inbox was full of requests then when I arrived to dinner there, it was a very prestigious forum. It's called the Falling Walls in Berlin, and lots of um, distinguished speakers uh, were there. And I went to dinner. I didn't know any of them personally, but they said, oh, we know who you are because you just had this paper that appeared everywhere. And um, and then the following day, there were like 25 reporters uh, put in one room because all of them wanted to speak with me at the same time. And it was sort of like a press conference, but I didn't expect that. And uh, and then they, you know, there was a, an Italian reporter from the back of the room. She she shouted, "So do you think you are Galileo?" And I said, 
you know, I, I'm not trying to be Galileo. I'm just talking about an object that looked weird, you know, like, obviously it will change our perspective about our place in the universe, you know, just, I mean, Galileo did realize that we are not at the center of the world and, and he realized it by seeing the moons move around Jupiter. So they are not moving around us. That was a very simple argument. Here is something in the sky that is not moving around us. Obviously, you know, it's possible the earth moves around the sun. Okay. And of course, the clergy didn't want to look for his telescope at the time. But I'm not making analogies. I don't, you know, it's not, science is not about analogies. It's about evidence. And here the evidence points in a, an anomalous direction. So let's, um, that's intriguing. Let's find more evidence. And a couple of years later, we discovered two interstellar meteors. The first, actually one of them was from 2014. It was um, the, the U.S. government data that was cataloged by NASA. And, you know, I was asked for a, t um, a radio interview about the meteor that landed uh, near the Bering, over the Bering Sea near Kamchatka, 2019, uh, January 2019. I was interviewed about it. it just a month earlier, it was um, documented. And uh, I didn't know anything about meteors. So I, I started Googling it. And uh, because I worked, as you said before, I worked on black holes. I worked on the first stars, but not on meteors. And then, um, so I then realized NASA has a website where they put a catalog of based on U.S. government data, uh, which was collected, uh, you know, as a result of the U.S. government wanting to find out whether there are ballistic missiles fired at the U.S., you know, so they're monitoring uh, the atmosphere of the Earth, and every now and then they see a fireball. It has nothing to do with national security, and they say, okay, well, that's a, an object that collided with Earth, okay? And it came from... Uh, a distant source, so we just put it out in the public domain. So these are the meteors, 273 of them. So I realized, oh, that's wonderful because they give the velocity components of each uh, meteor. And um, so I asked my student, Amir Siraj, I said, look, uh, there was this uh, interstellar object of Muamua. Let's check this meteor uh, sample and see if any of the meteors is moving too fast to be bound to the sun if we go back in time. Okay, it's very easy calculation. And we checked, and he came back to me and said, yes, there is one that is clearly of interstellar origin, this one, and uh, we then wrote a paper about it. But by that time, the community of astronomy was up in arms uh, 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 against any conversation mentioning the possibility of technological origin of anything. So uh, we submitted this paper, and... You know, the experts on meteors said, we don't believe the U.S. government. So I thought to myself, well, that's an interesting standpoint. Because, I mean, the point is the catalog didn't have any error bars because the U.S. government doesn't want to disclose the quality of the sensors they're using for national security uh, purposes. Um, and I said, well, they must know whether a ballistic missile will hit Boston or New York City. They must have very good... Uh, precision. But um, no, the paper was rejected from publication. Okay. So then I I was at the time the uh, chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies. And at dinner, I mentioned this um, situation. Uh, I gave a presentation and I mentioned to the board members, I said, look, this is uh, an intriguing meteor. We are pretty confident it's actually moving at 60 kilometers per second relative to the sun outside the solar system. It's a very confident, uh, in, you know, with, with great confidence, we can say that it's uh, interstellar. It's not just marginally unbound to the sun. It's, it's moving faster than 95% of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun based on the data. Um, and so uh, one of the members of the board was from Los Alamos, and he came to me and said, I will try to help you to declassify the error bars, the uncertainties in the measurement, uh, and it then took three years until uh, someone from the White House uh, named Matt Daniels uh, uh, was a, a, enabled, basically, a letter from the U.S. Space Command under the Department of Defense to NASA stating explicitly in March 2022, that was three years after our paper came out, stating that our paper is correct and that 
um, they can state that it, this object, this meteor, was interstellar at the 99.999% confidence. Just think about it, 99.999% confidence, okay? So they released it to NASA. It was publicly available. As a result, we resubmitted our paper three years later. And still, some people were unhappy saying, well, that's just the government saying something. How do we know that it's correct? Well, I, you know, if you look at astronomy, on many occasions, people report results. And you don't say, how do I know it's correct? If it's a, a, a transient event that happened only once. And why would you doubt, you know, just, I mean, in this case, the Department of Defense came to my defense. That's really unusual. Why would the Department of Defense be so much in favor of blue sky research uh, when the scientific community, like experts on meteors, would try to push back and reject it as much as they can? That, that is a very unusual circumstance. You know, you'd expect it to be the other way around. And anyway, the paper was eventually accepted for publication, and the government also released a bonus they gave us the data about the fireball of this meteor. And we were able to conclude that the meteor exploded at very high stress when it reached the lower atmosphere of the Earth and therefore had a material strength that is tougher than all other meteors in the catalog, 272 of them. So why would the first interstellar meteor be of material composition that is tougher, stronger, than all other space rocks from the solar system. And, you know, people can argue, oh, maybe it's made of iron as well, like iron meteorites. That's not my point. My point is the catalog includes 5% of the meteors are iron meteorites. I'm not saying what it is made of. I'm just saying it's tougher than all the meteorites we had seen before in the catalog. That is a statement that cannot be disputed given... The, the speed of the object and where the meteor exploded in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. It's tougher. And that's the first object from outside the sun. By the way, it predated the Oumuamua by four years. So now you have the first interstellar meteor being of material composition that is unprecedented based on space rocks. And the, we, looked, we found another uh, interstellar meteor. It was also tougher than all the others. So two interstellar meteors, the second one from uh, March 2017, about seven months before Oumuamua. And then you have Oumuamua being a weird shape, being pushed away from the sun by a non-gravitational force without showing cometary tail. And then the fourth object was a comet. Okay, so three out of four interstellar objects appear anomalous. And I say, that's intriguing. Let's collect more evidence. And my colleagues say, no, first of all, Oumuamua is natural. And, you know, we don't really care what the natural origin is, but it's natural. So why do I say that? Because the first paper to say that said it's natural, period. It was a review paper in Nature. And then a few months later, there was a paper saying, well, okay, but it's, it's indeed natural. But to explain the anomalous acceleration, we are suggesting that uh, it was made of hydrogen because then hydrogen would be transparent when it evaporates and it would be a comet, but a comet made of hydrogen, which is not produced in planetary systems, produced in molecular clouds. We've never seen a chunk of frozen hydrogen, but beyond that, I wrote a paper a few months later showing that it cannot work because the hydrogen would evaporate very quickly and would survive the journey. And the authors of that paper said, yes, we agree. That doesn't work. Okay? Okay. So then that doesn't work. So what was the alternative? Then another group came out and said, oh, maybe it's a dust bunny. Cloud of dust particles, a hundred times less dense than air on average. Very fluffy. So when it reflects sunlight, it's getting pushed. So just imagine it being as lighter than a feather, basically being pushed by sunlight. We've never seen such a dust bunny in space, the size of a football field. Uh, and the other 
the main issue is that when it gets close to the sun, it gets heated by hundreds of degrees and it wouldn't survive. It wouldn't maintain its integrity because it's so fluffy. It's, just think about something that is a hundred times less dense than steam, uh, uh, you know, the coming of a pot of boiling water. Anyway, then another group said, okay, well, it's not a hydrogen iceberg. It's not a dust bunny. It's actually, we know what it is. We nailed it. That's the answer. And everyone said, yeah, that's it. And they said, it's a nitrogen iceberg that was chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto. We have never seen a nitrogen iceberg, even though Pluto exists in the solar system. So they said, no problem. No, no, these are short-lived at the beginning of the solar system. There aren't any, none left in the solar system, but from other planetary systems. You know, just imagine crashing all the solid nitrogen on the surface of Pluto's in other planetary systems and launching those chunks into space. And one of them, the size of a football field, is a nitrogen iceberg that came from the surface of a Pluto-like planet around another star. And everyone said, yeah, that's it. And nitrogen will be invisible. And it makes a lot of sense. So we checked out the numbers, the mass budget. You just don't have, if you make very optimistic assumptions, basically saying all the solid nitrogen on all the Pluto-like planets that you can imagine, you know, uh, is being broken into pieces and you send all of those pieces to interstellar space, there is just not enough nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy to account for a large enough population of chunks that would explain Oumuamua. Okay? So then the latest, is a paper that appeared in Nature just a couple of months ago saying, in the abstract, it says, indeed, hydrogen iceberg doesn't work. Indeed, a nitrogen iceberg doesn't work. That paper says that. So we are sa- we found it. Now we know what it is. We found it. And I should say this paper was not only celebrated by a News and Views article in Nature, but also by all major newspapers who said, now problem is solved, we know. And the solution is, it's natural, of course. I mean, otherwise, why would they celebrate it? It's natural, and it is now we know what it is. It's actually just a standard water iceberg that we see in the outer parts of the solar system, but it went through a transformation, when it traveled through interstellar space, cosmic rays, very energetic particles that penetrated it, converted about a third of the water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. They broke these water molecules. And then the hydrogen, you know, migrated to the surface of this iceberg. And again, we see the hydrogen. Well, that's the hydrogen that pushes the object We don't see it because it's transparent. So it's a variant on the hydrogen model, except now you start with a water iceberg and you convert a third of the water molecules into pure hydrogen and oxygen. And they calculated the surface temperature of such an object at the distance of the Earth from the sun and said, well, that's just the right temperature to release enough of the hydrogen and give it the propulsion that you need. The problem is they missed a term that is a million times more important in the energy balance on the surface of this iceberg. Basically, they balanced the heat delivered from sunlight to the surface against the radiation from the surface. But they forgot to include the cost in energy required to dislodge the hydrogen molecules from the surface. So you need to invest some energy in, 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 in kicking the hydrogen atoms out of the surface. And it turns out to be an extremely energy-consuming process that basically lowers, cools the surface temperature well below by a factor of almost 10 relative to the calculation that they had in the Nature paper. So we wrote a paper a day later after this Nature paper appeared and showed that they made a mistake in the energy budget. And I mentioned it to the all the reporters that reported a day earlier about this nature paper. And some of them said, uh, you know, we don't want to confuse our readers, so we will not talk about this issue. And my point is that 
you know, science should be delivered the way it's happening. You know, so if there is an argument against this model, you may just put a footnote saying there is this other paper that says that something was missed. But no, it's better to maintain the narrative without, you know, reporting about challenges that this model. So, so my point is altogether, there were suggestions by the mainstream that this object is uh, natural in origin or Momo is natural. All of them involved a rock or a, an object of a type that we've never seen before, and all of them have challenges. And given that, it, in my opinion, we should leave the possibility that it's artificial in origin on the table and just try to find another object of the same class. And I'm actually planning to do that with uh, my students and postdocs because there would be a new telescope. I, the way I think of it is dating the next Oumuamua. So we have a dating app which is a telescope in Chile that called the, the Vera Rubin Observatory that will have a survey of the sky, the southern sky, every four days uh, with a 3.2 billion pixel camera. And it's very likely to find more objects like Oumuamua. And then we plan to extract those ob objects from the data stream of uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory and then um, follow up observing them, for example, with the Webb Telescope, the James web space telescope that will look at these objects from a different direction than earth-based telescopes and as a result it's just like having two eyes we can pinpoint the trajectory of the object to great precision in three dimensions because the reason we have two eyes is so that we can gauge the distance to a threat that was beneficial for us uh, to survive uh, in the jungle and uh, but in the case of the web teles space telescope and an earth-based telescope when looking at an object from two directions we can gauge the distance very precisely and pinpoint uh it in three dimensions and, and and by that infer whether there is any artificial propulsion acting on it and so that we can do much better than we could do with the uh, Oumuamua and moreover the web telescope can see the infrared the heat emitted from it and from that infer the um the surface area of the object because we know the temperature of the object from its distance from the sun. And uh, as a result, we can infer how big it is uh, and uh, how much reflectivity it has uh, with respect to sunlight. So these are things we couldn't pin down for Muamua. So there is a lot to be learned. We might learn about the material composition of that of the surface. That's why we need to find the next Muamua. And if, you know, there are some astronomers that are obsessed with Oumuamua. They, they are thinking about chasing it. And I say that's the wrong approach because, you know, like if you, if you came to a coffee shop and you saw some uh, potential partners there, but by the time you realize it, they left through the, through the door and they are now in the street and they didn't leave their phone number with you. It's, it's a bad strategy to run after them, especially if they move very fast. I mean, they move... In the case of Oumuamua, it moves faster than than uh, our rocket, so it's really difficult to chase it. Uh, but instead of being obsessed with that, such a thing, you just look for other, you know, Oumuamua-like objects or other partners um, that reflect what you liked about those that you saw before. So in this case, finding more Oumuamuas make a lot of sense. And in the context of the interstellar meteor, you know, this summer, 2023, we will uh, go on an expedition to collect the fragments left over from the first interstellar meteor. And then from the composition, we can tell whether it was artificial in origin or uh, or just an unusual natural object, this meteor. And um, once we um, collect a sample of whatever was left from it, already... Uh, arrange for a, a place for it in, at the Harvard College Observatory. We'll analyze it with the best instruments. If we find a gadget, I promise the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that will bring it for display there because it will represent modernity for us. And I asked my students in the last class of the semester just a couple of weeks ago, I asked them, you know, if you were to have uh, to encounter a gadget and it would have some buttons on it, would you press a button 
on an extraterrestrial gadget. And half of the class said, yes, definitely. They were, they were curious to know what will happen if you press a button. You know, just imagine uh, iPhone 100 or GPT 100 or whatever. Um, and half of the class was very, really reluctant. They said they will never press a button. And I asked, is it because you worry about yourself or humanity? And they said both. Um, so then uh, one student asked me, he, uh, he said, what will you do, uh, Professor Loeb? And uh, I said, well, I would, as a scientist, I would prefer to first take it to a laboratory and examine, uh, you know, what, what, what it's like. And um, before engaging with it, it's sort of like capturing uh, a traumatized, uh, intelligent animal, you know, like you don't engage with, with it until you figure out what's going on and you just bring it to the lab and carefully engage with it. And that's what I would do as a scientist. Hmm. Uh, well, a number of things. So one, I would also find it very difficult to resist pressing this button. Uh, then two, right. Um, with regard to chasing Oumuamua, not only can we not propel ourselves fast enough to catch it, but it's also so many millions of miles away that we lack the equipment to resolve it. So we can't continue to observe it, which is why this 11 day window in October of 2017 was so important. Then I, I think it's very, very cute to call this gaseous uh, interstellar creature, a dust bunny. And then uh, lastly, uh, to, I guess, continue our conversation. I want to come back to these two meteors and your journey to collect the fragments of one of them. But first, I'd like to get a bit deeper into Oumuamua, and particularly because of the the psychology of your critics and colleagues in the astrophysics community. So I want to get this straight: that there are I picked up, I think maybe five pieces of what to me sound like objective data that characterize this object. One, that its light changes by a factor of 10. Um, so it's got this reflectivity component. Then two, it came from the local standard of rest, which I think you mentioned is you would expect this from maybe one in 500 such objects. Then it's being pushed away from the sun by a force that isn't gravitational. It's not outgassing anything like that. Then, of course, is the fact that it's interstellar, which uh, is quite anomalous in its own right. And then you also mentioned that there's 90% evidence that this object could be flat and not cigar-shaped. So is this generally agreed upon, these five bits of evidence by the scientists who don't think it's alien in origin? And just to what degree, I mean, I don't know if you can put a number on it, does this make this object an extraordinary outlier compared to the other objects we observe. Yeah, so this was the first reported interstellar object. So that adds to the mix in the sense that the first thing you see in the street is usually a typical thing. If you see a person, you know, that's the kind of thing you find on the street. And so why would the first one be so different than what we are familiar with in the solar system? And even if you assign a 10% probability to each of these factors, 10% that it would be that extreme in its shape, 10% that it would be pushed away from the sun without showing a cometary tail, 10% that it came, even though it's one in 500, it's not 10%, it's one in, you know, so one in 500 is a much smaller likelihood. When you put all these factors together, you get a very small probability. Okay, for getting the first object, if it's typical to belong to this class, uh, with these characteristics. And that's what pushed me in the direction of saying, well, it may not be a rock. You know, it's just like a, a, a finding a, a tennis ball in your backyard and saying, you know, I, I'm familiar with the rocks in my backyard and this may have been thrown by a neighbor. So that was my rationale. I, I basically did not conclude anything from it. I was just saying, let's find more of the same. Okay, let's look at other interstellar objects. It could be meteors, it could be um, just passing near the Earth without colliding with it. And let's just check if any of them is technological in origin simply because they look different, okay? Now, if you are, if you have an agenda of claiming that anything in the sky must be of natural origin, 
then uh, you know that brings you to the point of view of you know not investing in the search. And I say, you know, you can argue like uh, quote Carl Sagan that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I don't have a problem with that, but my point is different. I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. So the point of science is seeking the evidence. If you are not seeking the evidence, if you say, I don't want to look through Galileo's telescope, you will never find this evidence. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to say, I don't have extraordinary evidence, therefore I should not search, therefore I don't have extraordinary evidence, therefore I should not search. Then you will never find anything. I would argue that searching for supersymmetry was done despite the fact that you may argue it's extraordinary. Uh, the mainstream of fundamental particle physics was engaged with the idea of extra dimensions for five decades, 50 years, the lifetime of a scientist, okay? They engaged with the idea of extra dimensions without having any evidence for it. To me, claiming that you have more than three spatial dimensions that we can't see, to me, it sounds extraordinary. Nevertheless, nobody said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence before they started to get engaged in extra dimensions within the theoretical physics community. And they were engaged with it for 50 years now. In the mainstream, thousands of physicists, the best minds, some of which advertise that string theory is leading the way of physics. People like Brian Greene, okay? like Michio Kaku would argue, string theory is the frontier of science, frontier of physics. We don't have any evidence for extra dimensions. Why isn't that an extraordinary claim? Why isn't that not followed or not funded because it's extraordinary? The answer is, without building the Large Hadron Collider, we would never be able to test supersymmetry. So you need to invest funds. You need to... Uh, in order to get that extraordinary evidence. And in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, we invested the funds. We didn't fight for supersymmetry, okay? So nobody says that was not the right way to do science because in order to find the extraordinary evidence, you have to divert extraordinary funds to do that because it doesn't come to your lap. Things that come to your lap without funding, you know, already came to our lap. You know, we saw birds, you know, for many millennia, then we, the Wright brothers imitated them. We saw birds, we were able to imitate them. Uh, this is an example of something that came to our lab. You know, we see the sun fusing hydrogen. Okay, we are able now, this past year, we were able to produce it in the laboratory. You know, that's the kind of things that fall to our lab. But the, the frontiers of science got to a point where you need to invest extraordinary funding to find new evidence to promote our knowledge. What we already know is, you know, something of the past. We, If you want new knowledge, you have to invest to seek the evidence. And so in the context of extraterrestrials, you know, we know that we exist and we know that planets like the Earth with similar conditions on them are very abundant, okay? And therefore it makes complete sense to search for things like us, Okay. You look at the mirror and you say, okay, there might be other people out there like me. So, you know, including Elon Musk, who actually used the uh, the, tes the Tesla road tester that he had. They put it as a dummy payload and launched it into space. So if he is launching into space his Tesla, why is it so um, ridiculous to imagine other entrepreneurs on planets around other stars sending junk into space. So there should be a lot of space trash and some of which, you know, may come our way. So imagine a Tesla passing near the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Uh, obviously, the astronomers would say, well, you know, maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, a dust bunny or something because we don't see any evaporation of this object. And it would reflect sunlight and maybe... You know, if it's sufficiently thin, the walls are sufficiently thin, it will, it will be pushed out. Actually, we didn't have that experience because uh, three years after Oumuamua was discovered in September 2020, uh, the same telescope in Hawaii, PanStars, discovered another object 
which was definitely pushed by reflecting sunlight without a cometary tail. And within three weeks, it was given the name 2020 SO. Within three weeks, they realized, oh, if we go back in time, actually this object came from Earth. It's a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966, and it had very thin walls. So it was part of a lunar lander mission. So we discovered our own product. 2020 SO was artificial, obviously. It had thin walls made of stainless steel. That's why it didn't evaporate. And it was pushed by reflecting sunlight because it was thin. So we know that it was artificial because we made it. The question is who made Oumuamua? Yeah. And, you know, we haven't talked about the sorts of functions that the two meteors might have had were they extraterrestrial. But sticking to Oumuamua, you averred earlier that, I mean, two possibilities. One, that it might be a, a light sail or a light sail propelled object. Or two, that it might be a fragment of this interesting, well, we would call it science fiction, uh, given that we don't have well, this. But, I would call it uh, space trash, basically. It could be just space trash, uh, uh, you know, a piece but, of a, a layer. Of, yeah, of, an, of the yeah. Dyson sphere anyway. But this then raises the question, though, how, I mean, given the incredible, almost incomprehensible vastness of space relative to the size of these objects and to us, why of all places you think Oumuamura might have ended up here, only to do apparently nothing? Right. So there could be two types of objects, space trash that have no functional purpose. You know, they just uh, that, think about Voyager a billion years from now. Okay. It will not be operational. It will be just... And if it collides with another planet, it would appear as a meteor. And then you can, uh, you know, if you find it in the ocean floor of that uh, habitable Earth-like planet, you would recognize that, you know, it had material strength tougher than iron because it was constructed as a, a spacecraft. You know, that, that could be, but it's a piece of junk. That's why it collided with the planet. So think of Voyager appearing as a meteor. That's one class of objects in a billion years, okay? Not functional. But another type of objects is uh, functional devices. Uh, and that, for example, could target the inner region of a planetary system, like the solar system, where uh, it might have liquid water that is useful as fuel. Uh, you know, you can use the starlight to break the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen and then use those as fuel. And then uh, one place to refuel uh, in an in interstellar journey is to visit every now and then the habitable region of a planetary system like the solar system, the, the region where the Earth moves around the sun, where liquid water is in abundance because uh, water ice is much more difficult to excavate. Uh, so in that case, if you see a certain number of objects in the vicinity of Earth, uh, uh, it, Earth's orbit around the sun, it will not be representative of the average number of objects per unit volume in the interstellar medium because they prefer to visit those regions close to stars every now and then. And so there would be m many fewer of them. Like, we, I did the calculation, it's about a factor of 10 billion less objects if they are targeting the habitable region around the stars like the sun, um, compared to a situation where you have objects on random trajectories that fill up space uniformly. The other thing I thought about is that, um, you know, I, called, I, I wrote a paper about galactic kites. These are ob films that are less than a micron in, in thickness. You can show that the radiation force pushing them from all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy is strong enough to lift them uh, relative to the gravitational pull that the disk of stars of the Milky Way has. So if you were to send those kites into interstellar space, they would just hover above the galactic disk. So you can imagine this being 
I don't know, a, a, a fun project for an intelligent species or something to brag about. You just lift those kites and monitor them or use them for any per- for some purpose. But if they are, they are easier to manufacture in terms of having many of them because they are thin, they don't carry as much mass as solid spherical objects. And, and they would be carried away by radiation uh, over great distances. So um, the other thing to keep in mind is that all of these physical objects that are launched by chemical propellants, they, or by uh, radiation pressure, they w- would move at speeds that are far, at least an order of magnitude below the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. So the Milky Way galaxy will keep them bound by gravity. And that's very different from radio signals that move at the speed of light, which escape the Milky Way galaxy. So if a signal was sent a billion years ago, it would be a billion light years away from us. It would be far away. We wouldn't be able to detect it. Whereas if a package was sent into the Milky Way galaxy with chemical propulsion, you know, it would still be, it would accumulate over time in the volume of the Milky Way galaxy, just like plastics accumulate in the ocean. You know, in 2050, uh, the amount of plastics in in the ocean in our oceans, the mass of plastics would be similar to the mass in fish, which is something to worry about because that means that the fish will eat the plastic. They already eat it, and we eat the fish, so we will have more plastic in our body uh, bodies, and and that's a big risk, health risk in the future. Hmm. Well, it's. It's amazing how rich these topics are. I mean, we didn't get even to a quarter of the material I wanted to explore. Uh, It's funny, my eyes, I was just thinking about how best to put this. My eyes are always bigger than the clock's stomach, Uh, not mine. But I want to make sure that we get to talk about Interstellar, so your upcoming book. And how what inspired you to write this for yeah there 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 it is and i'm going to mention it of course in the introduction but how does it build on some of the subjects we've been discussing so this book uh talks about the implications to humanity uh from realizing that there may be a smarter kid in our cosmic block and the uh, you know my two daughters when they were young and They stayed at home and they thought the world centers on them, just like humanity before Galileo and Copernicus. Um, And once on the first day when we brought them to the kindergarten, they had a psychological shock. And of course, once they realized there is a smarter kid in their class, um, they realized that they can benefit from that kid because they can learn something new. So humanity... You know, in particular, imagine that we realize some new technologies that we can import to Earth and uh, learn about new science that we haven't uncovered as of yet. You know, there are lots of unsolved problems in science. Uh, Most importantly, most urgently, is the unification of quantum mechanics and gravity. And uh, we know that we haven't reached the threshold of understanding how to do that because... There is no theory that explains what happens inside a black hole at the singularity where the curvature of space and time diverges. We don't know what happens there. Clearly, quantum mechanics would remedy this divergence, but we don't know how. We don't know what happens to matter that falls into a black hole. I once had this insight that, you know, once my, the sewer at my home was clogged. Uh, so I went there with a plumber and they realized while we were fixing it, we realized that there were tree roots that were blocking the the flow of water out of my home. And I then for the first time realized that, you know, the, the water coming from my home goes to some reservoir. And perhaps in the middle of a black hole, there is such a reservoir where all the matter collects. It's sort of like a very dense set uh, object at the maximum density we can imagine, the Planck density, that keeps accumulating the matter that falls into a black hole. But we don't know for sure what happens inside a black hole. And I once advised uh, my colleagues, uh, string theorists, uh, to test their ideas by going into a black hole. And they blamed me for having ulterior motives for sending them into a black hole. 
But anyway, uh, we also don't know what uh, happened before the Big Bang. You know, that's a, an unsolved problem. And one possibility that I always imagine is uh, that once we figure out how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, we will be able to design uh, an experiment that will create a baby universe in our laboratory. And so um, it's possible the Big Bang uh, was created by uh, quantum gravity engineers in uh, white lab coats. Uh, and of course, if we ever realize that this is indeed the origin of a universe like ours, you know, we will not feel as orphans of quantum mechanical fluctuations of the vacuum the way we are imagining the beginning of our universe right now but we will have a sense of uh, meaning to our lives, just like orphans finding a parent, you know, like that would be the sense of meaning. So it will change the, the meaning of our cosmic existence. By the way, Steven Weinberg, the Nobel laureate that, uh, from whom I learned the, the uh, basics of cosmology, because I read his book um, uh, on cosmology uh, when he, and he wrote it actually at Harvard, uh, the same uh, Center for Astrophysics that I'm in right now. He wrote his book on gravitation and cosmology, but um, he also wrote a popular level book called The First Three Minutes. After, you know, and uh, at the end of that book, towards the end, he says that the more the universe appears comprehensible to us, the more pointless it looks. And um, my my point is that uh, the reason it appears pointless to Steven Weinberg and to many cosmologists right now is because we didn't find a partner as of yet. You know from personal experience that when you find a partner, the meaning of your life changes. Uh, and so my point is that uh, the universe will not appear pointless to us as soon as we find a sentient partner, some other civilization that we can have a relationship with. And it will change the meaning of our existence, our aspirations for the future. It will change, uh, you know, the way we behave. Be you know, because as of now, we're spending $2 trillion a year on military budgets, um, protecting ourselves against others that might try to kill us or trying to kill others. And, you know, with $2 trillion a year, we could launch a probe to every towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy by the end of this century. So all we need to do is just listen to the words of John Lennon and follow them. Imagine all the people living in peace. And maybe, you know, maybe we can imagine that if we find another species that did listen to these words and explored interstellar space. Well, one question that this immediately raises for me is that you personally, and I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you, might find yourself or think of yourself as an orphan of quantum fluctuations, as you put it, um, and that finding a partner in some alien civilization would give us more meaning to our life in some way, if we if we could understand our origin. But it, could unify, uh, it could unify religion and science, by the way, because because God is the the idea of God is an approximation to a very advanced scientific civilization. Well, that that's exactly where I was heading. I mean, a lot of people think that their their life already has meaning because they do not think that they're orphans of quantum fluctuations, but children of some god or or some other force of this nature. And finding alien civilizations and coming up with this a different origin for the universe and for humans would really unsettle the way that they view the oh, world. Oh, no. It would actually reestablish it based on evidence. So here we come back to my original theme that we must be guided by evidence. I mean, we can have stories that we tell ourselves, but they are very different from having evidence in the real world that we all share. We're, we're not talking about, you know, the experience of Moses seeing the burning bush and calling it a miracle, okay, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. What I'm talking about is the Galileo project that I established at Harvard using infrared sensors to look at the burning bush, measure its temperature, infer its distance from triangulation, and figuring 
figuring out how much power it emits and saying, well, this power cannot be the result of a regular natural bush burning. It must be of a different origin. Okay, so if Moses had a scientific team like the Galileo project that I have at Harvard with instrumentation, he could have assessed clearly whether he's looking at a miracle, what he calls a miracle, which means that it's not a natural object. And my point is having that evidence changes everything. You know, Moses believed in God because it looked really strange. But my point is it could have also been a natural object that was burning more than expected. And so you stress, though, that you believe that we need evidence. And I, I totally agree with you. But the thing is that I don't believe that the majority of people do. So I don't share your optimistic opinion about how the world at large oh, would, would integrate. You know, I, I, I'm not necessarily an optimist in this. Con I'm oh, generally okay. But in this context, what I'm saying is I subscribe to Darwin. And I say the fittest will survive. And of course, if humanity is not fit for the task, you know, if it prefers to believe in legends, in stories that have no evidence to support them, it will not survive very long. Okay, that's fair. Because yeah, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the world at large uh, integrating this new sense of our origins in a way that's uh, that's okay. favorable. But maybe, maybe it will be AI systems that are more intelligent than we are. Maybe they will take responsibility for our future. So I, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, I, I, I'm very proud of our technological kits, you know, the AI systems like GPT-4 and beyond that may actually uh, could become AI astronauts that venture into space and basically represent us in the long term. Uh, I would be happy with that. I don't necessarily want to die on Mars the way Elon Musk wants and um, but I do think that the gadgets, you know, that have artificial intelligence could be our future. And in that sense, you know, perhaps we have too much pride in our role, cosmic role as humans. It's more about creating children that would surpass us in the sense that they would not be accustomed to zero sum game, uh, you know, that was important for us to survive in the jungle, in natural habitats, and we, we keep using it in the context of wars and so forth. So we might perish within a few centuries because of that instinct that we have to be self-destructive, okay? But if we leave behind a child that is not guided by zero-sum games, that is that has a bigger horizon that it's guided by, that goes into space like AI astronauts, then that will be the next step. And, and the way to, f to get a glimpse of it is to find AI astronauts from another civilization because they would teach us about our future. These are the fittest that survived, you know, in the long term in the cosmos. So that's another thing that I'm interested in, another reason that I'm interested in exploring this because we will get a glimpse at our future and it may be very different than our past. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not under the illusion that humans are necessarily the fittest to survive in the long run in the cosmos. Hmm. Well, just briefly, because I think we only have a, a few minutes left, but I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe enumerate a few of the topics that get covered in Interstellar, just so that we have a, a better idea beyond like this question of religion, for instance, what sorts of topics you discuss in the book. Yeah, well, so other aspects are what makes us human. Uh, and uh, in that context, I talk about Stephen Hawking that who visited my home uh, in his last visit to the U.S. Uh, for Passover dinner. And um, in my mind, he represents uh, the fact that human, what makes us human it has nothing to do with our body because he was unable to actually use it. Um, it's our thoughts, our desires, our aspirations. And I talk about that and how it connects to our exploration of interstellar space and the possibility that we find evidence for others. And also, what do we expect others to be like? And 
So there is a lot that the book talks about, and I don't want to reveal its content. I would highly recommend that you check it out when it comes out at the end of August. Um, at that time, I should also have uh, the findings of the expedition uh, from the Pacific Ocean. I hope to survive that journey. I'm happy to sleep next to the machine room uh, and uh, basically lose a lot of sleep just examining everything we bring up uh, most of which will be probably just mud and, and not so interesting. Uh, but if we do find any evidence for an artificial object, you know, that would be quite amazing. And uh, uh, it's not about uh, me. It's not about um, the scientists who are doing this exploration. It's about the message that it will bring to uh, humanity. And I do think that could be the, the biggest discovery that humanity ever made, if we, if we can substantiate it. You know, some, some, this subject has a lot of people making claims over decades. And to me, you know, it's just like people trying to get into a castle. This is the castle of knowledge on this question, okay? And they keep banging their bodies against the locked front door they keep saying i believe there is something inside this castle and bang 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 they can't get in and i say well that's not the right approach the right approach is let's find the keys to that to that door okay and and, and even a kid who, who, who finds the keys can just open the door without much effort and let us in and in this sense it's important to maintain our, our childhood curiosity without uh, prejudice, you know, not arguing forever that anything we see in the sky must be natural in origin and just open, being open-minded just like a beginner's mind, you know, that in Zen Buddhism, that's a fundamental principle, basically behaving like kids and being open-minded, okay? Because if we find the key, and the key in this case is the scientific evidence. Once it's conclusive beyond any reasonable doubt, everyone that looks at it would say yes, now I'm convinced. So it's not a matter of the government disclosing things that they keep behind closed doors or, you know, it's not about that. It's about finding clear scientific evidence that can be shared with everyone because scientific knowledge is to be shared by all humans. Uh, and the government is not the best organization to explore science because they are interested in national security concerns and, and that is guided by what lies outside our national borders, okay? So it's completely opposite to what science is about, which is sharing information, an infinite sum game where everyone benefits from knowing something new. And so, you know, when people say Oumuamua was just a comet and we couldn't see its cometary tail, it was a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, a water iceberg, whatever, but we couldn't see the cometary tail, I draw an analogy with Hans Christian Andersen's tale of uh, the emperor has no clothes, where the kid just said that the emperor had no clothes. The kid said, looked at the emperor and said, the emperor has no clothes. But all the adults around the kid kept insisting that the clothes are beautiful and they're just invisible. And I feel exactly like this kid, where all the experts on space rocks say, this was a comet, but the cometary tail is invisible to us, but it's a beautiful comet of a type that we've never seen before. And you better believe that. And it's being celebrated by science journalists, even though we have no evidence for that cometary tail. So I prefer to be, you know, at, at that position of a kid. And actually the biggest compliment that I got was just recently that uh, there was a prize that it was uh, given to my book uh, by um, a group of 600 high school students that voted in favor of it out of all the science books that appeared in a foreign language over the past uh, year. And Exoterrestrial, my previous book, was selected. And to me, that's the greatest honor, much more than a committee composed of senior uh, colleagues, because it represents the raw curiosity of uh, fledgling scientists, you know, and that's what we all should be, irrespective of biological age. 
So if you want to think about me, a simple way to think about me is, is as a farm boy. I was born on a farm, connected to nature, and I still think like a kid. I don't want to pretend that I know more than I actually know. Well, this has really been the the tip of the iceberg on life outside of Earth. So I'm really thankful for your time and generosity in, in starting the conversation here for the show. Thank you so much, Robinson. It has been a great pleasure. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.